Hey guys, now quickly I'd like to show you how I did the camo pattern and the detail colors on my Mark 44 Ammonite by Hasegawa Models. Here I'm starting off with a Studio MAK Classic Mr. Color number 60 RLM Grey and it's one of the foundation colors for the Machine and Krieger look. This time I'd like to show you something new. This is creating a tone from our existing paints. Now the reason we do this is to have the uh, the, the, the paints work well together. It's, it's called color harmony. And we do it for the very simple reason of making the model look cool. If the, the colors have some harmony and there are tones, tints and shades of one another, they'll look good together. To be really clear, I'll just do a very quick lesson. Now we can say our basic 12 colors are called hues. Then we can tint them by adding white. We can shade them by adding black and we can make a tone by adding gray. Now in this case, I'm adding, uh, it's a green gray, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being arty here, but RLM uh, gray, it's a, it's a gray, so I'm adding a tone to my base color paint here, which you can see in the first video of this model of adding the base color. Please click the card above if you wanna go have a look. Here working with my tone, I'm going to sketch out freehand the camo idea for the model. Now. Here, just relax and take it easy. I know some friends have told me they freak out when they see me freehanding on a camo onto a model, but so long as you keep some very basic principles in mind, it's, it's fun, it's easy, and it's relaxing. I mean, it's designed to make the model look cool. Everything's, everything's fine, and, and these aren't real, so you know, we, we can take it easy. Now, what I'm going to work with here is something called a uh, counter shade, a counter shade camouflage pattern. And it's something we use in Machine and Krieger a lot. It's very popular. Uh, Yoko san loves them. And uh, he calls it a counter color scheme. And that, that's a very legitimate way to call it as well. And you can see them a lot in nature. That's a great way uh, and a great place to go for inspiration for this. Look at the camouflage patterns on rays, sharks, and a lot of marine uh, aquatic life creatures. So just going down to the aquarium and taking my daughter there, I get a lot of inspiration for painting camo patterns. Now whether these patterns are real life effective or not is up for debate and to be honest we don't know why marine life have these patterns on them but our thinking of humans was that if we put the darker color on top and the lighter color underneath it would run counter to how light naturally falls on an object. So uh, if light falls on an object it should be brighter on top and darker underneath right? The counter shade idea does the opposite to that. Now, when I apply that to a science fiction model, the effect is just that it looks really cool. It's a way to, to break up a large space and uh, replace it with a, uh, an arbitrary camouflage pattern that, that looks good in between. Now, this is probably a good point. I just want to mention this as a friendly aside. When you're painting camouflage patterns onto a model, be careful that they're not too good. Now, that sounds really funny, I know, but if your camouflage pattern is too effective, it will effectively break up the outline of your model and it will reduce the visual impact it has for people looking at it. And that's not what you want, right? You want your model to pop and look very cool. So although I want to, so that, that, that's the fine line. That's, that's where the, the artistry comes in. You want it to be a, a camo pattern that looks cool, that might look effective in the real, real world you think, but still works to highlight the model. Easier said than done, right? Generally speaking, I don't want to make my camouflage patterns too tight. Uh, tighter camouflage patterns on infantry size models do increase the effectiveness of the camouflage. And like I said before, it's not always something we really want. So I look towards uh, some marine life, like I said before, and if you're stuck, you can still go with say, uh, patterns that are useful on larger vehicles, say armor, and uh, ships or uh, aircraft and they will look cool on mecha uh, that that's one you can use and can just transfer it across and just change it from a horizontal medium to a vertical medium i know i'm waffling a little bit on this now it may not make a lot of sense what i will do is show you through examples like this model here sketching around the model i'm still using that that medium size flat uh, so medium stiffness uh, sable brush that i bought at sakaido in shinjuku 
and uh, I can use the point here and the edges. It's not super important. I'm not looking for a, for a strong line or de uh, demarcation, excuse me, just yet. I, uh, I just want to kind of, I'm sketching in where my shadows and light will fall, first of all. And just to make a, a pattern, get it pleasing and uh, something that I'll be happy with to tighten up in, in subsequent steps. And that can be mentioned here, that this is a very loose part of the process. You can't mess this part up. If you don't like it, you could just go back with the original base cover. It will very easily cover this step. And with the heavy texture on this model, uh, the brush strokes, etc., just won't be an issue. So enjoy this one. Uh, be bold and experiment and, uh, and have fun with it. Here's a great spot to show you if you get stuck with, uh, with adding your counter shade, just paint up. Seriously, um, go up from the, the bottom of the model and paint your lighter colors going upwards and try to aim for about the halfway mark, but make it interesting. Fly casual, Chewy. For this project, I wanted to go with an all-star MAK cast. So I've gone with Middle Stone here, also by Mr. Color. Number 21, it's also a Koyokuyama Sensei favorite. Now please note, in keeping with the idea of mixing these colors to create harmony between them, I've added this straight in over the top of the previous mix. So it still has Field Grade 2, RLM Grey, and now Middle Stone over the top of it, all making an interesting tone and blend. So it's very much a custom and unique color, but it's, it was easy to do. Coming in here for a very important technique note. One of the ways to really make your camouflage schemes pop is to leave a different color border when you're going in between colors. So here, I'm going to try to paint the middle stone and keep it within the borders that I outlined with the RLM gray. This works for a number of reasons. One of the most simple ideas is that it helps your eyes to step between the colors. And as we've established before, because our colors are tones and uh, shades of one another, the color balance is natural. So stepping between them is quite comfortable. The other idea is, this is another one of my concepts of economy of effort. I've laid down the other color. If I completely cover it, why did I do it? So I want to leave some of that previous step poking through in between this one to add interest and visual appeal. You can see here, as I'm sketching it on, middle stone is quite yellow. Well, at least it looks yellow compared to the gray tones that we've been working with. This is part of my plan. I want to use bright yellow as an ID color. So having the camo pattern point towards the ID color so that it has an overall, again, color harmony. And that's something that you can set up and plan for when you're thinking about what to do with your model. After following up with that, I got the camouflage pattern all over the model as I liked it, but the lower half of the body needed a little bit more definition. It needed more detail. Just the visual appeal for the lower half of the body was, was, was a little bit lacking. So to bring it back together, I went back to my base coat, field gray number two, and I added that back to the mix. And I'm putting back in a retone of itself, I guess you could say. This is something I'll often do. So I'm adding a slight squiggly line around some of the pattern. Now, in the first stage of adding the camouflage pattern, I've left some line behind. Now in different parts of the model, I'm re-adding it over the top. Now, for some people I understand that may be difficult to do, it may be difficult to let go and understand that you've got different things on the model. But I'd like to suggest that it actually improves the visual interest on your model. And again, this is something I learned from Koyokuyama Sensei. Uh, I noticed that different places of his model, I'd say, so you went over one color here with this one, but then you've done it the other way around. And he'd look at me, smile and say, you know, number one, wow, your eyes are really good. But he'd say, listen, just make it look good. Sometimes it's good to go one way, sometimes the other. Uh, just make it, just make it work. And he's exactly right. So if I hadn't explained this to you, when you look at the finished uh, photos of the model, you probably can't pick it. But in some places, I've added the outline between the camouflage patterns as another, as another step. And overall, the balance and harmony is good. So please don't be shy to do that kind of thing. Uh, if you think it needs it and it needs another step, go ahead, try it out. And uh, you know the, the worst thing that can happen is that you you need to backtrack and you need to paint over it. But you know it, it's also one of the best things that can happen if you're bold and it works out and it looks great. You know you've done it, you've you've hit it. 
Coming in here for a gratuitous close-up, um, I'm getting a little bit better. I'm learning the skill of painting for the camera. And you know, it, it is a skill, it's different because you know, I'm not painting for my eye line. I'm trying to paint for yours. Now going in here, here I, I just sketch around it. It doesn't need to be perfect. In fact, you can see the, the model is wobbling a little bit in my hands here, you know, through the, uh, the, the joints moving and it helps to add a little bit of uh, variation uh, to the line. But you know, I, uh, I'll be honest that I am kidding though. I'm not letting the models, you know, join some wobbliness, paint the thing for itself, but it does help. It adds to some of that random factor that we just can't control. Now, last touch up on the camera, I decided towards the end that it needed dots. There was something about it that it was lacking just a little bit in detail. So I thought I added a couple of dots with that uh, same duck uh, field grade two that I was using for, for the outline of the camera at the same time. And uh, I'm pretty happy with how that went together. Now I need some white paint. Do you remember that white paint I used on Barbatos uh, Lupus? Well, here it is. I added a little bit of thinner to it and despite that being, what, a week or two, couple of weeks ago, um, the paint reactivates. I, I mix it up like this. Uh, that bug comes into shot, that's free. I was doing this out on my balcony, so uh, <laughs> that came in. And uh, so act reactivating the paint here, make sure you get the uh, the lower layers. See, sometimes this paint, Mr. Color, when it reactivates, the upper layers will, will, will wet very quickly, but you need to make sure you get all, all, it's almost like a two layers. You know, you get the upper layer, which is more of the colors, and then you need that, uh, the, the more sol solid substrate underneath that helps it to, uh, to, to really stick onto the model. So make sure you give it a really good mix to reactivate it. Uh, once that's done, it works just like brand new paint. So here I am, I, I needed a bit more thinner. Um, wind blew that bug away. And so I was out here in the afternoon. I, I didn't want to, uh, the wind was good. The weather was good. I saved my family. Uh, I don't want my girls to be, to be smelling the, uh, the fumes. And it's good for me too, uh, out in the fresh air. So I give it a really good mix here. And this paint's really good to go going straight over the lower layers. Now, I haven't added any colors or any mixing here to, uh, to get tones back together, but what I'm going to do here is try to leave patches of the undercoats to represent chipping. Again, that economy of effort. Um, now, I could do, I, I know there's lots of fancy popular techniques there in uh, applying different, uh, different, different levels, different layers, different materials, so that it makes the, the paint easier to scratch off. I can show you them as well, and I'm quite proficient in a few of them, including one that I helped invent as well. But this method is, it's, it's simplicity. It's just paint, you know, you, some paint and a brush. So paint it on, go slower with this one. This one is not such a relaxed, uh, loose process, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. This one is a more careful one. I'm carefully putting the, the paint on in different layers and building it up, and I'm very mindful to leave chips. Now, instead of painting chips on as a uh, additive process, I'm leaving the gaps in the paint here to, uh, to let it simulate chips in a way that, you know, those chips never happened. So, in a way, they're very realistic because that chipped paint is not there. Uh, there. There really are gaps in the in the white paint, allowing the uh, the lower layers to show through. It is a little tedious. Uh, I'm not going to uh, to shy away from that. But all methods that show a uh, high level of detail and uh, and chipping are tedious. Now, especially if you start getting into other other methods with chipping, salt, uh, different fluids and masks, they're even more tedious in my opinion. I've I've done them all. I've tried them out they take more time because of the number of steps. And this one, you can see it in a few minutes, I build up what is easily a comparable, if not better, uh, solution. And it, it works really well, but it does require something that the other techniques say they don't, and it's a certain level of skill with a paintbrush. That's why working with a paintbrush, it's never a bad idea. Being handy with a brush is a skill that will always stand by you. Uh, relying on techniques and gimmicks can get you so far but you'll still need to get good at, uh, at painting. So the, the, there's, no, there's no easy way around that. So uh, putting in the time to, uh, to work and uh, make effort and practice, it always pays off, always. And, and you know, it's fun. You, you, you feel quite, I got to admit, once I finished painting something like this, I painted it. Someone will say, how did you do that? With a brush. I just, you know, I just made it happen. And it's a very satisfying process. Now, working from one side to the other, 
Whilst one side of the uh, the face mask here is drying, I move back to the other side and, and vice versa. So it's constantly drying. That is one of the things that's necessary for this is a relatively quick drying paint. So over the course of the face plate drying, I can move around, keep adding layers and, and build it up until it's got enough white paint opacity that it looks believable to me that it sells the concept that that was a, uh, a white chipped paint. Last detail to add, Mr. Color 113 RLM Yellow. Now, keeping with the, uh, the color cohesion with this project, this one matches up very nicely and it's a classic MAK color used by the studio. Now, here I'll show you a goof. Here's where I messed up. My paint here is a little bit too thin. So I didn't get good footage of this because I'll need to let this paint uh, sit and thicken up a little bit or, or start painting it. But generally, with these really bright colors, the, the, uh, the, the bright hues, the, the primaries that I use for ID colors, I'm almost always going with paint straight from the bottle. I, um, I added too much thinner, but you know, it's still going on okay here. It just required a couple of coats to build up. So it's not a mistake that caused me any grief or, or loss of sleep. It, uh, it just didn't make for good video this time. Sorry about that, guys. But um, you can see in the photos, I just um, I gutted it out. I added a, quite a few handful of steps and uh, finished it. Hope this video showed you some useful tips and strategies that I use for putting camo patterns on the Studio MAK models. If you like this kind of content, please do subscribe. And um, don't hesitate to visit my tip jar on Patreon. And uh, throw me a couple of bucks. Thanks. Bye.